This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website creation platform. Hey guys, remember when you watched the Hawkeye series on Disney Plus? What do you mean you didn't watch it? Guys, this is Hawkeye we're talking about. The Hawkeye. Everyone's seventh favorite Avenger. I know there's only seven Avengers in the movies, but that's still top ten. Well, since I'm clearly dealing with a bunch of Philistines who don't understand art. When they see it, or in this case don't, as none of you tuned in to watch it, Hawkeye was a series released back in 2021 on Disney Plus and is famous for being a show with an even number of episodes and it featured characters who were portrayed by actors. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Okay, so the show wasn't anywhere near as disastrous as some of the more recent Marvel series, sure, but it did commit the cardinal sin of sitting on the fence. It was too bland to be laughed with and too inoffensive to be laughed at. It was, in a word, boring. It also followed the classic Disney doctrine where you take a once loved character who is now older and less able and then have a much younger and smarter companion drag them through the dirt just to highlight how senile and useless all of your heroes really are. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any heroes. But as it turned out, people actually really liked it when Disney did this. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, they absolutely hated that when that happened, didn't they? <laughs> My bad. It's a sad time we find ourselves living in, but it is the time in which you sat there in the cinema or on your sofa, fingers crossed, hoping that Disney kill off your favorite character. I thank the Lords of Entertainment every night before I go to sleep that Tony Stark was killed off when he was, because Lord knows what Disney would have done to this poor man if he was still around. I say this, but people weren't exactly overly enthusiastic about Hawkeye, even when Marvel was at its peak during Phase 3. To put it into context for you, Bread Drop got four times the amount of viewers as the Hawkeye series. Now, just before you say, oh, but Johnny, that's just a stupid YouTube meme. That's not a series like Hawkeye. Wrong. Allow me to present to you Exhibit B. That's right. This is a series too. There's many captivating episodes, just, just like Hawkeye. Waffle Drop got 8.66 recurring times the amount of viewers as the Hawkeye series. You get the point I'm trying to make, right? that people these days would rather watch baked goods fall over than Marvel. Okay, that is just a little bit of silliness, but if people had actually tuned in and watched the Hawkeye series, they would have been introduced to the topic of today's video. Mm, Maya Lopez, <laughs> I genuinely forgot her name. Maya Lopez, AKA Echo. But just before we take a look at the mildly forgetful character that is Echo, apparently, a word from today's sponsor. Hey there, I'm standing up. Squarespace is the easy to use all-in-one website creation platform that is here to help get your website up and running. From start to finish, I got my website up and running in just one hour, and that included the seamless process of attaching a domain name to my website. Once I'd finished designing the look of my website, I simply searched Johnny Law in Squarespace's database. It gave me a host of suggestions and prices to choose from, and a couple of clicks later, and johnny-law.com is up and running. Squarespace is specifically designed to be easy to use. So even if you don't have the first clue when it comes to anything web design, don't fear. All of the templates and tutorials that Squarespace offer will help to get you exactly where you want to be. So to get you started and to get you 10% off your first purchase of a domain or website, head to www.squarespace.com forward slash Johnny Law and make sure to use code Johnny Law at checkout or simply click the link down in the description. And thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thank you, Squarespace. Very cool. The show kicks off with Echo's origin story, and more specifically, the story about how she became an amputee. Well, all right. Everyone loves a good origin story. So, how'd it happen? Did she kick a shark to death and get it chewed off in the process? Maybe it was like a 127 hours kind of situation. She had to cut it off herself. Well, not quite. Turns out she lost a leg because her mom isn't very good at driving. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't a split second decision kind of thing. I mean, as you saw from the clip, Maya has the time to notice something's wrong, sign to her mum asking her what is wrong, 
A little bit of a pause, then the crash. I actually timed it from the moment where a mum realizes that the brake doesn't work to the point where they crash, and it took about eight seconds. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, fair enough. Eight seconds doesn't sound like a whole lot of time, but in reality, in the world of reaction times, eight seconds is that's closer to a decade. That that's the amount of time some Japanese office workers take off in a whole year. Okay, you're ready. So you've noticed that the brakes on your car don't work. You could do something about it. And stop. That's about eight seconds. You know, you, you get the point I'm trying to make. Eight seconds is enough time to do, well, something. Not to mention the fact that she could have steered onto either side of the road and just come to a stop in one of the two perfectly empty fields either side of her. But no, this mad lad decides to try a look plowing into a busy T-junction with a young daughter in the car. And man, if only every car pretty much ever made came with like a second brake. Oh, wouldn't that be so good? You could call it something like a, uh, like a, like a handbrake. Or like a, nah, that wouldn't catch on. Uh, a parking brake. <laughs> something like that. Can you imagine how useful that'd be in a situation like this? <laughs> that'd never work. The point I'm trying to make is that a mom had a whole lot of time to do a whole lot of different things other than plow into a T-junction. And after careful consideration, she decides to take the literal worst option as she put innocent civilians in danger, as well as her own daughter. Now, I'm not going to say it deserved because no one deserves to plow their car into oncoming traffic, but stop, hear me out now. If you are deaf, because yes, a mom is deaf as well. If you're deaf, don't have the best reaction times and don't have the best know-how when it comes to operating a motor vehicle, maybe don't drive. I don't know. Is that a hot take? I feel like it shouldn't be. Also, you gotta love the fact that their ethereal ancient ancestors telepathically warned their grandmother about the impending crash, <laughs> but not them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gee. Oh, thanks, guys. So it turns out that she lost a leg because a big shard of broken glass from either the windshield or one of the windows impales a leg. Now, I don't know if you know this, but by law, all windows and uh, windshields have to be shatter resistant to avoid, well, exactly this kind of thing from happening. Now, you might say, ah, but, you know, this is uh, this is a flashback to when Echo was a kid. This would have been, I don't know, late, late 90s, early 2000s. Safety wasn't quite the same back then. Well, turns out that shatterproof windshields were first used in the 1920s as they are one of the oldest safety features developed for cars. I'm just saying, you know, like, my mum isn't very good at driving. It's just, it's just not a very cool origin story for someone with superpowers. Also talked to my mum about this because my mum has worked with leg amputees for her entire career, decades at this point. Uh, and she said that an injury like this is, it's rather unlikely that it would call for an amputation. And even if it did, uh, it would probably be as a result of an uncontrollable infection caused by the injury and not the injury itself. So that just makes it even less cool than it was. Because keep in mind, this is, this is like a super story. This isn't, you know, this isn't real world average Joe type of stuff. What is it with Disney Marvel and underwhelming car accident origin stories? They just, they just really seem to like them. And here's a quiz question for you. Who does Echo's grandmother blame for the accident occurring? Is it A, Echo? Is it B, Echo's mom? Or is it C, the Michelin man? Well, if you guess D, Echo's dad, you're absolutely right, because of course it was his fault. Because, wait, what did he do? You took her from us. You. All right, I think it's time to go. No, it's time for him to go. I will never forgive you for this. Yikes. I mean, you know, I know it's a daughter and everything, and this would obviously be an incredibly hurtful occurrence, but that is a horrible thing to say to someone who's just lost the mother of his child. This is also his wife we're talking about, by the way. Like, what the hell is wrong with this woman? Anyway, after this incident, Maya and her dad then moved to New York, and I've, I've got to give props where props are due. They did a pretty good job of casting a kid who looks just like a young gecko. And we then flash forward in time and we catch up with the events that happened during the Hawkeye series, and that was when Echo's dad was killed by Ronan. And like any newly orphaned, deaf, indigenous amputee, Echo attempts to steal a motorbike. And when she's caught, rather than turn herself in, launches said motorbike at a police car, as you do. And then of course, the now infamous fight scene between Daredevil and Echo. Now, they released this clip ahead of the launch of episode one to drum up a bit of hype for the series, but the internet did what the internet does and ripped it to pieces. And it's understandable. I mean, you know, the choreography is perfectly serviceable. The execution, on the other hand, is 
it's it's not so great. There's a lot of hits that clearly don't connect and it kind of takes you out of the action. It feels a little bit pantomime -y. There's one moment where Daredevil catches one of her kicks and then just gives her like a little love tap on the leg. And of course, the infamous delayed kick. Now, a lot of people, understandably, ripped into that scene, but uh, I, I unironically thought it was actually kind of cool. She takes a second, finds a target, and then kicks. I don't know, it, I thought it looked kind of sick. You know, adds a bit of syncopation to the fight scene, but uh, you know, I, I, I can see why it might make some people giggle. Then comes the scene where Echo shoots Kingpin point blank in the face, and we then flash forward five months to the actual start of the Echo series, where Echo has a gaping wound in her abdomen. Where did this gaping wound come from? Who knows? All we know is she needs urgent medical attention. Or you could just do that. That, that. that should do the trick. Remember that, guys? If you ever find a giant gaping hole in you that isn't supposed to be there, just put a bandage on it. You, you'll be fine. Maya then meets her cousin, who is called Biscuits. Maya? It's me, Biscuits. Oh my god! What kind of a name is Biscuits? It's like, it's not even Biscuit, it's it's plural. We're talking multiple Biscuits. This is Maya. She's our cousin. She's good people. Wait, what? The dog is deaf too? What is... Why is he signing to the dog? Is everyone deaf? Question! If you're a career criminal who has uh, been seriously wounded and has recently performed minor surgery on yourself, what do you do next? If you said go to a roller rink, <laughs> you're thinking, right, that's exactly what Echo does. So, it turns out that the roller rink is owned by her uncle and she's there to talk with him in private. Okay, sure, but why do you need to speak in private? No, no one can overhear you speaking sign language. <laughs> I would think that was one of the benefits of sign language. So, it turns out that she's gone to meet her uncle in order to get a bullet wound properly stitched up. Now, if you find yourself wondering, well, why would she ask the owner of a roller rink for minor surgical procedures? Don't worry. I'm wondering that too. Why are you doing this? Okay, so she wants to start some sort of gang war in her hometown. Yeah, sure. Sounds pretty base to me. Can't see anything going wrong with that. I should be fine. Then, episode 2 kicks off with a flashback to the year 1200 AD, and from what I can research, it would appear as though there's a little bit of creative licensing slash historical inaccuracy going on. There's a lacrosse-like game being played between two opposing tribes of Native Americans. Now, it is historically correct that some of the oldest team sports can be traced back to native tribes who played many forms of what could be considered to be an ancestor to the more modern game of lacrosse. And one of the oldest forms of this game was traced back to a 17th century Canadian tribe. So with the information that we have access to today, it would suggest that Disney's depiction of this sport is, you know, about 400 years too early, which is, that's a, that's a decent margin of error. Look, if I said that the Magna Carta was signed on the 14th of June in the year 1215, that would be historically inaccurate. It was actually signed on the day after that. That's one day, but that's still inaccurate. We're talking 400 years and the wrong country. Also, the keyhole camera that Echo uses after drilling a hole into the shipping container was clearly USB type A, and she's using it plugged into her phone. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any phones that have USB type A ports. Nope, you are nitpicking and biased. I win, bye bye. And then, whilst trying to escape the train, Echo gets a prosthetic leg caught in between two of the train carriages, and then begins having flashbacks of her ancestors, and in doing so, finds the strength to push the moving train off of her leg. That was the thing that happens. And that is how Echo discovers that she's got superpowers. That's cool. That's, that's really cool. Echo had hitched a ride on the train in order to break into one of the shipping containers that was being shipped on that train. Now we see her kind of messing about with uh, some of the shipment. We don't actually know what it was that she was doing inside the shipping container, but later on in the uh, episode, we find out exactly what it is that she did. Oh, 
cool. She's uh, she's an actual maniac. In short, she did appear to kill a room full of henchmen, but that bomb could have literally been set off by anyone at any time. It was set off by the guy opening it. What if they? What if it had been stopped by like customs or something? Hey, would you look at that? The, the sun's come back up, and I've changed my clothing. I definitely didn't. I don't know. Forget to press the record button or anything. I wouldn't do anything like that. That would be stupid. So we know that Echo's uncle has something to do with that railway. I think that, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think that he oversees that, that shipping route. Uh, so do you want to see his reaction to finding out that his niece has kindly placed a bomb on one of his trains? Hello? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You gotta love a bit of mild disappointment when you're informed about a terror attack that somewhat implicates you. Ah, oh, not again. And then onto episode three that starts with a five minute silent film about another one of Echo's ancestors. It turns out that she comes from a historical lineage of girl bosses. Yeah, so that is pretty much the plot to Echo. And I think that is possibly the most Disney thing I've ever heard. So Echo is, and I'll, let me make sure I get this right. She is a, she's a newly orphaned, deaf indigenous amputee who can telepathically somewhat communicate if not interact with a string of uh, her ancestors who at one point in history or another were a girl boss within their time uh thank you echo very cool the first of her ancestors started life itself apparently the second was a prestigious sportsman woman and the third was a police officer and now we have Echo, who is a terrorist. That's so cool. <laughs> really? She's even got one of those shoe knives? <laughs> like that crazy lady from, uh, from Russia with Love. Oh my God. And then in what is one of the sillier scenes from the series, Echo manages to fashion a makeshift gun out of parts that she found in a roller rink maintenance room. So Echo is capable of many things, but one of those things now is apparently having an incredible knack for making improvised firearms. <laughs> Points for creativity, I guess. Uh, you know, call me, you know, a spoil sport, but could you not have instead just thrown a really large, heavy object at her head? I mean, <laughs> you've tried to, uh, I mean, and somehow successfully incapacitated a rather rotund woman by <laughs> gently firing what looks like ball bearings at her. Could you have not thrown like, I don't know, like a boot at her head? You know, like that, maybe just knocked her out like that. Like <laughs> she spent all that time doing some sort of art attack, like Frankenstein bodge job. Where's that niece of yours, huh? By a Lopez. Lopez who blew up the armory. You know, it's never actually explained how any other character would have any idea that it was Echo that blew up that armory. Just a, a good guess, I guess. But never mind that, because Echo's grandfather has some words of wisdom for us. I guess we all do things we wish were different. I guess we all do things we wish were different. I guess we all do things we wish were... Does that make sense? I feel like that doesn't make sense. And just when you thought there couldn't be any more wisdom uh, imparted upon you, uh, Echo's grandma then uh, begins telling Echo about the story about uh, the night that her mum was born. And uh, apparently, while she was in hospital giving birth, there were complications during the procedure. And against the doctor's wishes, what her family did was they took her out of the hospital on a stretcher and into the woods. <laughs> okay. Against the doctor's orders, I found me. Took me out of the white hospital. Brought me to a midwife where I could be surrounded by my sisters. I think it's very important that I state that I am not a medical expert. However, I think I'm pretty confident with making the claim that no medical complication has ever been made better by removing someone from a hospital and putting them in the middle of a forest. I, I don't know, I'm just saying. But unfazed by her grandmother's unusual birthing stories, Echo instead chooses to challenge her for disowning her as a child. So by proxy, you too. <laughs> like, oh no, no, 
no, I didn't disown you as a child. I disowned your father who owned you. So, you know, it's not the same thing. This woman is such a nasty piece of work, she's actually giving Echo a run for her money. And she's a terrorist! She tore her entire family apart because she couldn't bear to look at Echo because she was somewhat similar to her mother. <laughs> That's such a cool thing to do. That's really nice. I think generations are echoing, reaching out. Okay, so I know that Disney has draped this whole show with Native American culture, and that's cool. But if you leave that to one side, if, if you strip that away and look only at what the writers have given you, what they have produced as an actual product, the TV show itself, this is the plot. What Echo's grandmother is saying is, she's saying that I think that the woman who started our tribe, a policewoman and a lacrosse player, are reaching out to us from beyond the grave because we've been such awful people to each other and the people around us that we've completely screwed up our own lives and now need a, a, a bit of spiritual guidance from those from a, a, a time once gone. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. I am unbelievably uneducated in pretty much every field, especially Native American culture. I know essentially nothing, but I'm gonna go ahead and say, you don't deserve the help from your ancestors. Work it out on your own and stop being a dick your whole life, you evil, crazy people. Well, would you look at that? It looks like Echo's been taking lessons in firearms etiquette from Alec Baldwin, as she's just got a finger lazily hanging over the trigger, which might not seem like a big deal, but that is literally one of the first rules of holding a firearm, is that you don't have your finger hanging over the trigger like that in case you accidentally pull it. Someone who has been trained essentially since birth to be an assassin would know not to do that. I know it's a small example, but it is a small example of a great deal of incompetence. Was there not one person on set that could have said, hey look, someone in your position with your level of skill would never hold a firearm like that. Just take your finger off the trigger, please. So Echo then meets once again with Kingpin, who reveals to her that it was in fact him who killed his own father for beating his mother. And Echo is incredibly shocked by this revelation. I don't understand why she's so shocked. Didn't this conversation happen mere minutes ago? You knew what you were part of. At every turn, all the people you killed for me. Did you plead for their lives? So Echo, by this point, has killed a whole string of people, most of which ordered by Kingpin himself. She's watched Kingpin literally beat people to death in front of her. But then when she finds out he killed someone who she already knew was dead, she's like, <gasps> How could this be? It turns out you're not dyslexic, you're just really, really stupid. And then comes the climactic crescendo of the entire series, and Echo confronts Kingpin for the final time, but Kingpin has preemptively captured her mother and her cousin. But rather than fight it out in a blaze of glory in order to free the one she loves, instead what they do is they have an interdimensional healing session. <laughs> <laughs> because why why would that not be a thing that they would do and yeah sure i mean love it out instead of fighting i mean that's a cool message that's all fine and dandy on the surface but the fact is it's just a complete bait and switch the writers aim all of the blame towards kingpin in this final scene seemingly exonerating echo of any wrongdoing but that's just not how it works you know doing one good thing does not heal a lifetime of wrongdoing you know instead of having to face the brutal reality of who she's been who she is and what she's actually capable of she instead asks kingpin to let go of his anger and that somehow makes everything right again and they all live happily ever after i am a little puzzled by the moral of the story because yes although she emotionally healed kingpin who is a bad person Echo is still a career criminal slash terrorist. You know, not exactly superhero behavior. So I don't know how Echo has suddenly been awarded the title of superhero now by fans and the media. I mean, she wasn't a superhero in the comics and she certainly wasn't a superhero in the show. You couldn't even call her an anti-hero. She was just a straight up villain. She planted a bomb, not knowing for sure who would set it off or where it would be set off. 
She went home after 20 years of ignoring her entire family, expecting them all to, without question, become accomplices in her gang warfare, and then got pissed on more than one occasion when they either questioned her or just said no. She used and emotionally manipulated her cousin and her grandfather to get what she wanted, whilst ignoring the fact that her cousin and grandmother even existed. Her grandfather also handcrafts a new part for a prosthetic leg that contains, like, you know, some sort of symbol relating to the tribe that they descended from, and she just says she would have preferred something more minimal. You uh, don't uh, like it. Look, indiscriminately placing explosives on trains that anyone could open and detonate, I, I can forgive that, but being ungrateful is just, that's just, that's just beyond the pale. While Disney was smart enough not to label Echo as a superhero, because she isn't, she has superpowers, sure, but she doesn't use them to help others or to fight for what is just. She uses them to help herself and to get herself out of situations that she's put herself in. And by situations, I mean organized crime. But, uh, you know, that didn't stop entertainment journalists being, well, entertainment journalists. Marvel's Echo is a one-of-a-kind superhero and an inspiration to the deaf community. Tell me you didn't watch the show without telling me you didn't watch the show. Well, I can agree that for deaf viewers, well, I mean, deaf viewers who speak ASL, unlucky all other deaf people, but for deaf people, it must have been cool seeing a titular character using sign language on screen. However, saying that a character like Echo is an inspiration to all deaf people is, if you've watched the show, a pretty offensive thing to say to deaf people. That would be like saying Gone Girl is an inspiration to women everywhere. Like, just because you are a thing doesn't automatically make you an inspiration to other people with that same trait. I mean, it's the same old Disney Marvel formula, really. It, it looks nice enough. You know, the casual viewer will be tricked into having a decent enough time because of the expensive cameras and the smattering of emotional music here and there that might fool you into thinking there's been some sort of profound emotional character development, but look deeper than the very surface level and you'll quickly notice the lack of sophistication, a lack of moral backbone, and the fact that Echo is not held accountable for any of her actions, which leaves you with an incredibly vapid show that's message seems to be, you can be as nasty as you like as long as you do one good thing afterwards. It would have been so much cooler to see a series where Echo is torn between assigning the blame to Kingpin and those that manipulated her and, you know, molded her as a child and what she is actually capable of holding herself responsible for. You know, to what degree is it manipulation or her own actions that's actually caused her to be a terrible person? Now she's having this moral awakening, now she's back with her family. That would have been so much more interesting. Constantly walking the line of, is she a hero? Is she a villain? Does she see herself as a villain? Does she see herself as a hero? But no, instead you get this, like I say, incredibly vapid tale. I mean, yeah, it's not exactly breaking news that Disney has uh, been lacking a bit of moral integrity uh, and has done for a hot minute at this point. So I'm sure that comes as no surprise. What did you think of the series? If you watched it, let me know. And uh, I do appreciate you for watching this video. And I'll see you in the next. And as always, a shout out to the patrons and the channel members. We have the top tiers, the knights of law. Infinite Dum Dum, Pazabon, Flunky, David, Jax, Koss, Michael Terpia, Texas Lawman, ATS, Dagger D69, nice, Saint Nemo, Steve the Goat, Michael, Nostagmus, the Grand Admiral, Jordan96, and Saitama Kano. To all of you guys on the top tier, I thank you for serving the realm. Of course, we have the tier two, Saeed, Dr. Malski, Yon, which had you, Canada Gromachi, Mark Maiden, Sensei Fang, Mendicant Bias, Agent MO62, Stu Cheeks, Michael S, Rich Walwick, McLegend Face, Kidnap Tiger, and Say It. To all of you, thank you very much. And of course, a big thank you to each one of the tier ones as well. To everyone on this list, thank you very much. It means the world to me. And there we go. Another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do, you little bitch. But until then, take care of yourselves and I'll see you very soon.